Math 43, I had a question coming out of chapter 9, number 104. And here we were told that we surveyed, if I look through this, 273 randomly selected teenage girls that were in Massachusetts um, between 12 and 15. So maybe preteen, but teen. And then after these four years, we asked them, hey, did you smoke to stay thin? And is there evidence that more than 30% of teenage girls smoke to stay thin? So imagine you were one of these girls, right? You were one of these 273 girls and think about what are they asking you at the end of the four years? And they're asking you, did you smoke to stay thin? And your response back will be a yes or a no, right? So this is technically a categorical variable. So if I, oops, I actually have it up here from before. So our variable, is whether or not this teen smokes to stay thin, it is categorical. And really what I'm gonna keep track of is I'm gonna turn that into a numerical variable. I'm gonna turn it into the number of successes, right? So the number of teens who smoke to stay thin in our sample, and then ultimately I'm gonna turn that into a proportion. So this will be the proportion of teens who smoke to stay thin. But because I have this categorical variable, I am in prop land. And I'm going to run a Z hypothesis test. And once I run that test, and I'm just going to scroll this up, once I run that test, I'll be able to figure out which of these options I, I want, A, B, C, or D. This is a multiple choice question, but ultimately it, it deals with step 13. What is your conclusion? So let's go through and write these up. So for my first step, I need to define a parameter. And that's either a mean or a proportion. We're in proportion land, so I'm going to define P to be the true proportion of girls between 12 and 15 years old who smoke to th stay thin. So true proportion of girls between the ages of 12 and 15 who smoke to stay thin. All right, and, and these researchers, they're interested in um, if there's more than 30% of girls smoking to stay thin. So when I go to create my null and my alternate, I'll put colons after the ho and the ha. Whatever letter you define up in step one, it should show up in the null and the alternate. So this is gonna be 30% is our starting point, and we're suspicious that it is greater than 30%. And that comes from quite literally this phrase right here, more than 30%. So I'm gonna take that phrasing and turn it into a greater than alternate. And then if we go through step four, I was not given an alpha, so I'm gonna to default to 0.05, industry standard. And let's go check some assumptions. So for assumptions in prop land, well, the first one's always the same. All right, did I have a random sample? And let's go look through the wording of the problem and see, yes, I see the phrase random. So I will say, yes, I had a random sample. All right. And then I need to check normality, or at least if I'm on a sampling distribution that's um, normally distributed. Uh, so I need to check, oops, excuse me, NP and N1 minus P. And sometimes there's some confusion as to which proportion to use. And you might be thinking, well, what, how many proportions do we have? Well, we have two. And so we have this 30% here, but we also have this 63 out of 273, right? I have my sample proportion, but this is quite literally a sample proportion, right? That is P prime. And really what we're doing in every hypothesis test is we are always assuming that the null is true. So we're gonna build our sampling distribution around the fact that the null is true, meaning I'm gonna use this proportion in my assumptions of 30%. And just as a general rule of thumb, I'm gonna unshade that just so it's not crowded. Whatever your statistic is, whether you're in mean land or proportion land, this will not show up until step 10. So whatever statistic you're using, we don't even really bring that into our write-up until step 10. So going through here, I had a sample size of 273. I'm gonna multiply that against 30% and I'm gonna get 81.9. That is greater than or equal to 10. And then I'm gonna do its complement. And when I crunch that number, I'm gonna get 191.1, which is also greater than or equal to 10. And what that's saying is, 
if the null was true, right? Because this is always our condition. We're assuming the null is true. If the null is true, and I really surveyed 273 teenagers, I expect almost 82 of them to say yes, right? Now, keep in mind, that's a pretty big gap, right? We only got 63 to say yes, all right? So there's something off. Just right there, I'm like, mm, something's not right. I, I'm, I'm already thinking that, uh, that something's a little bit off, which is fine. Um, I, I actually, I don't think at this point, I, I would say I don't think it's greater than 30%. I actually think it might have been less than 30%. But anywho, something's a little bit off. So I would have expected about 82 successes. I had 63. I would have expected about 191 failures. I had, I think, closer to um, 210. All right, that's fine. Just things to take note of. All right, our sample size, is it small relative to our population? And I'm going to just check this and, and say yes, because really, if you take 273 girls, you multiply it by 10, you'd have 2,730 teenagers. I, I think it's a very safe bet that there are more than 2,730 girls between the ages of 12 and 15. So I can sample without replacement. Great. All right. So let's go for the um, distribution. We're gonna. You can either tell me you're on the Z distribution. You could have told me you're on the standard normal curve but that's the one we're gonna be working with. And I am gonna run a one sample Z proportion, conf not confidence interval, sorry, we're on hypothesis tests. Uh, I don't have any degrees of freedom in proportion land, uh, so that's great. Um, for our test statistic, that's always a fun one, so let me write this out. This is gonna be P prime minus P over the standard error off of our sampling distribution. And then for step 10, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to fill these numbers in. Now, let me just crunch this real quick. So I'm going to do, I want to find out the decimal value of 63 out of 273. And really, uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to cut over to my calculator and get all of this stuff at once. And when I say all of this stuff, I'm going to get steps 10. Oh, let me switch to my highlighter because this is, again, it's pretty crowded. And I'll change colors. I'm about to get steps 10. 11 and 12 right from my calculator. So let me go ahead and move over and I'm going to use the app. All right. So let me fix this. So let me let me clear out of this. So we're on our home screen. I'm going to hit stat. I'm going to go to tests and we're going to run a one prop Z test. So I'm going to hit option five and then I'm going to start to input this stuff. So my sample, excuse me, my null proportion is 30%. These next two entries need to be whole numbers. I had 63 successes out of 273 trials. Keeping in mind that a success means a teenager, a teenage girl is smoking to stay thin. I don't actually think that's a success, but it is what we're keeping track of. I, when I say I don't think it's a success in the real world, but it's what we're keeping track of for this problem. So that's why you can't see my air quotes of success. So I'm going to hit enter there. And then at least on the app, you need to go through the different options here. Do you have a not equals to alternate, a less than alternate, or a greater than alternate? And we had a greater than. And okay, so things that I'm taking away from this calculator output, you can see on the right column, even though I can't highlight it, uh, my z-score, my p-value, and then you see that little p with a hat over it? That's your calculator symbol for p prime. There's not a consistent symbol in the stats community for sample proportions. Some people use P prime, your book does. Some people use P hat, your calculator does. But there is that ratio of 63 out of 273. It's about 23.1%. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna move back to my write-up and I'm gonna say that this really been should have been on here. This was about 23.1% minus the null percent of 30. So that's a pretty big gap when I see 23% to 30%. That's a 7% gap over 0 0.3, 1 minus 0 0.3, and then my sample size here was 273. Now, I, I don't want to calculate that number, and I don't have to. I'm going to go back to my app. It's on there. It looks like that number was negative 2.496. So great. Let me head back there, negative 2.496. And then if I wanted to get my p-value, which again, I could just get from that calculator output, but just for fun, let's go over how you could create this probability statement. We are on the z-distribution. If I go back to my alternate, it was a greater than, so I'm going to put a greater than here, and my test statistic was negative 2.496. 
So since this is on the standard normal curve, I'm gonna go ahead and use normal CDF. And we're gonna go with a little low, high, and then mean and standard deviation, always default to zero one on the standard normal. And this is gonna be a gigantic number. I'm not gonna calculate it. Well, I mean, I actually kinda of already did. It looks like it's 0.994. And then you can see that graph there, you're shading most of the curve. Well, you're shading 99.4% of that curve. So I'm gonna write both of those things out. All right, so let's go here and we would get 0.994. All right, and then let me go ahead and draw my graph. Z's zero under the curve and our test statistic ooh, was all the way over here at negative 2.496 so if I wanted to shade that you can see I would shade a big proportion 99.4 percent of the area under my curve and it's very close to a hundred percent all right so if I look at that um, that's this number or excuse me if I Went ahead to step 13, which is where we ultimately want to get. You always want to check your p value against your alpha. And in this case, our p value is much larger than alpha. So because our p value is greater than alpha, we're going to fail to reject H0. All right. So at that point, if I know, <coughs> excuse me, if I'm failing to reject H0, I do not know what got into my throat right now. If I'm going to fail to reject H0, A is out and B is out. All right. So I know once I fail to reject a null, there's not sufficient evidence. And then we have to just look at the options here. There's not sufficient evidence for the alternate. So the alternate is that the proportion is greater than 30%. So you can see that option right there in option C saying, hey, that's that's what we have. So I, if I wanted to write this up, I would say we do not have sufficient evidence that the true proportion, oops, I had some notification. I promise I'm not popular. Um, that was just my computer dinging. Um, we have sufficient, or we do not have sufficient evidence that the true proportion of girls between the ages of, of 12 and 15 um, who smoke to stay thin is greater than 30%. All right. So if I zoom back on this, you can see it's a fun little, well, I actually do think it's fun. Um, it's a, there's, anytime you have a hypothesis test in this class, you got your 13 step right up, but the all, um, multiple choice options really have to do with step 13. So theoretically, you know, you could do most of this work on your calculator if this was a real multiple choice. Like if you were on an exam and it was a multiple choice, you could do most of this on your calculator. But it's great practice to write your 13-step write-up. And, you know, on homework, I always want to see um, work supporting um, any multiple choice question. So I hope that helps. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.